Yo, what's up everyone? Got a bunch of people already hanging out here in the room. I see some comments. I'm here with uh, Sam Guayana. Did I say that right? You did, yeah. All right, awesome. Yeah, here with Sam. Uh, we're going to be diving in soon. We'll give it a few minutes to make sure everything's working here and let people connect. But um, this is going to be fun. Drop a comment uh, for us, guys. Let me know. Let us know where you're watching from today. Let's see if anyone's like stayed up till two in the morning or something to uh, <laughs> catch this. What's up, Diego, Kevin, Craig, Giovanni? Nice. Seen some dudes who have come on to a couple of my videos at some times too, so that's pretty sweet. Nice, awesome. What's up, Domingo, Johnny, Matias? Questions already. Thoughts on the Aventone CLA ten? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. They look cool. I imagine they're fine because Aventone are using the same stuff in the paper cone, and nobody's been doing that yet. So, I mean. They're, they're probably great and they're an easy way to not blow, you know, a lot of money on an old pair of NS10s that someone's trying to like price gouge you on. Right. What are you mixing on now? Still NS10s? Still NS10s. Yeah. I've got the sub with them too, but uh, yeah, the older ones, the ones that like aren't supposed to be good for me. You're on the same ones, I think, right? Or are you on the other ones? I don't know, man. They're just NS10M. Uh, I don't really know much, <clears throat> much else about them. Yeah. They're, um, they're all right. They, you know, they're NS10s. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. This is great. Uh, Cameron, David, what's up, guys? All right. So let me let you guys know how this is going to work. Um, we're just, I'm going to kind of do a quick little interview of, of Sam here. I got some questions for him. And then Sam's prepared a really sweet, in-depth walkthrough of his mix for the song Bad Habits off of Silver Scene's most recent album hopefully you guys have checked out that song that album sounds amazing which is why i wanted to interview sam here and have him show us inside the mix so we're gonna do that and then after that we'll we'll come back here and uh, we'll just hang out for a bit and do some q a so hopefully you guys have some some uh, questions ready i know i've seen a couple already we did what that ns10 question for fun there but save your questions till kind of after the mix walkthrough and uh yeah i think this is gonna be super valuable for everyone so thanks for hanging out all of you guys. So Sam, thanks for hanging out here. Why don't you give everyone yeah. kind of the super quick version of your story, like kind of how you got into producing and mixing, how long you've been <clears throat> doing this and, uh, you know, any maybe big milestones that you've had in your journey so far. Yeah. So I started when I was about 14 years old, uh, just a like M box and like a basement kind of thing. And, um, it just, it kind of grew from there. I played in bands and things like that. And I recorded a lot with those bands, but eventually it came to that point in my career where I was like, you know, my band had just ended. I was just moving to Toronto. It was an opportunity to, excuse me, to, to put like a new, uh, you know, like work on a new chapter in my life. And, um, and I put full effort in about, well, I put full effort in about six years ago, but I put like a lot of effort, especially when I moved to this city about five years ago, uh, opened my studio and just started, you know, doing projects out of there, like almost instantly. Um, I don't know if there was many, I, I don't know if it was a big turning point or just a really like, like linear progression. Well, I guess it wasn't that linear because the last three or four years have kind of been a little more exponential, but it was, um, it was just a lot of like, you know, I, I'd record a few friends bands, uh, you know, all those bands would break up, form five new bands. Two of those bands would break up, form, you know, another four bands. And I'd keep clients through that. And then it, it, it happened so that, you know, a couple of those bands ended up taking off and sticking with me or just I did a cool EP of theirs that led to other work. So it was pretty, it was pretty like a nice, just smooth growth to where I am. And then the Silverstein thing happened by just uh, staying in touch with Paul Mark, who I knew from older bands and things like that. And, uh, when it was, uh, <clears throat> I mixed a record that he produced and then I did a shootout for their, for the record dead reflection. I didn't get, but that kept us even more in touch. And we started working together on some projects and the silver scene one was kind of, a, you know, another linear move just from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. How do you, I mean, you said you opened your studio in Toronto five years ago and kind of had clients right away. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. Was that, like you said, just from being in the scene with your own band or. 
Yeah. So uh, up until then, I'd, I'd had a studio in Caledon that was kind of small. Uh, actually, it was a big studio, but you know, it was in, in Caledon, which is really small. And it was a barn. It was ugly. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I was recording a, a few friends out of that place. And then one of the bands that got a little bigger, like Pacific, sort of helped push me to move to Toronto because a lot of them didn't travel and I really wanted to work with them and I just wanted to get out of Caledon. Um, so I had pretty steady work. I picked up a lot of work while I was playing in my band and stuff. A big part of my band were was setting the goal of not just being lazy with anything. So when I recorded the record, you know, I wasn't comfortable where I was mixing. So we sent it out to a big mixer and a lot of people loved the sound of the record and loved the production on it. So it led to, you know, picking up work along the way. And again, that just sort of grew from there. Right. Yeah. So would you say that kind of moving to the, to Toronto, to a bigger city was, was pretty instrumental in kind of helping your career grow pretty quickly? Yeah, I a hundred percent, I would say that it was, um, <clears throat> it was one of those, one of those like, scary moves. Like it's, it's a life altering decision at that point. So it was something that not only did I do, but I started to put, you know, if I was putting in 100% effort before, which I, I wasn't, you know, because I was dividing my time, it was a, the goal was to just go hard into it right when I moved into the city. And yeah, moving down here helped a lot. Um, it's really appealing to a lot of bands, especially when they're on smaller labels, if they're traveling into the city to be in like a hub city to do work. So, you know, they'll crash my studios in Leslieville, which is just on the other side of the the, the highway in Toronto, but it's still basically, there's still streetcar access. You, you're 10 minutes to downtown. You can do anything you want. The East End's also beautiful in the city. So it was, it was this nice comfortability factor and really brought a lot of people from, oh, I don't have some random like space in the middle of nowhere. I, I have this like Toronto studio for people to come to. Yeah, for sure. And just probably a lot more, just a hu way bigger pool of, of clients, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if, for those of you who don't know, um, Sam's a drummer. We, I think we met like, geez, I don't know, almost 10 years ago, maybe, maybe <laughs> eight, something. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, so, so Sam's kind of been like his, uh, his influence, I guess, or just him himself has been woven through kind of, uh, stuff that I've been working on for a while. Uh, we made some drum samples together. Those of you who are in my hardcore mixing program or anything else, you've probably heard some of those samples that we made. Uh, and, um, what else dude is there? Oh yeah. I was going to say, uh, those of you who are in hardcore tracking, uh, the bonus videos there about tracking drums in a small room. Uh, we filmed those at Sam's studio and he's the one playing oh, yeah, drums. That's my place. Yeah. When we did, uh, you know, when I did the demonstration of, of how to do these different drum making techniques. So that was at Sam's studio. He was playing drums there. Uh, so those of you in kind of the hardcore music studio world, you probably, whether you know it or not, uh, are a little bit familiar uh, with Sam. So in uh, in 2015, so five years ago now, it's crazy to think it's been that long. Uh, when I first released Hardcore Mixing, you were one of the first guys to jump on it and join that course. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to see like what your, what you think the impact that that course made on your, kind of your mixing, just your, your, your thinking, well, I, I don't want to preframe. I'll just leave it up to you. What like what, what yeah. impact did that have on have on you? <clears throat> it was it was really interesting because I think that was one of the first times there was something available to me that was in more of the genres I was working in, or at least relatable to the genres I was working in. You know, a bit more of like a a polished rock sound. Um, the videos had a pretty big impact. It was nice to actually see someone dive in and. Um, see the similarities between the things I was already doing and how to refine those and also just sort of reassure that I, I was like, I'm sure everybody feels it, but you get, you get these little bouts of like imposter syndrome and I'm just like, I don't know how to do this thing. And then I'll watch a, a technique of yours and be like, Oh, I do that exact same thing. It doesn't sound as good yet. Cause I'm still working uh, around the rest of it, especially back in 2015. But like, it's cool to know that I'm at least on the right track. And those videos really showed me that, you know, refining your craft and and working hard especially when you're watching someone do that uh it's 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 good that you can it's good that you have that little bit of um yeah, like a virtual pat on the back like okay cool i know what i'm doing or cool i'm learning something really awesome at the same time yeah it's interesting how I, i've heard that feedback a lot of you know some for some people it's like it's totally revolutionizes how they're doing something for other people they're like 
man, it's so good to see that, you know, someone are, is doing the same things as me on like professional records. And it's just like this confidence and almost like this feeling of like, okay, like I just need to keep doing what I'm doing, which is maybe just as, as valuable. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So fast forward, that's five years ago. Fast forward to, to today. It's about five years from then. And like you said, you've been, you've been busy full time getting clients and kind of working your way up the ladder that entire time. But I find this story is so, I just think it's awesome that in hardcore mixing, uh, you know, you're, you're learning, you're looking inside my mix for a Silverstein track from their Mm -hmm. seventh record, I think. And then a few years later, you are producing and mixing their 10th record, which is the one that just came out. And that's the one we're going to dive into today. So, man, I just, I wonder if you could talk about kind of the feeling you had landing that project. Did you feel like any, any pressure going into that? Oh yeah. <clears throat> so I did the, I did the redux first with them, which was like a 12 song re-record, And I felt a lot of pressure with that, but it, it was at least, at least a little easier because we weren't doing a lot of crazier production. We were updating the songs. Funny enough, the song I felt the most pressure on was smashed into pieces. Cause you also did a version of that song and oh, it was yeah. fairly recent as well. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm just redoing something that's redone well <laughs> again. So that was when I felt, in that moment, I didn't feel too much pressure. I'd sort of known the band a little bit um, in passing, and it was a really easy experience. But when we did, that was so that was like October 2018, yeah. Um, in March 2019, we did Burn It Down first for a single on its own before doing the record. And that was... Uh, and like for some reason, an insane amount of pressure. I remember the first day I went to the gym after uh, the first day and we, you know, we just finished pre-production and we're in my studio instead of uh, union where I ended up doing the rest of the record. Um, and I just remember like halfway through the gym, I had a huge panic attack. And I, I guess I was just really nervous that first day, even though I worked with them before, it was a different creative process. I was working on a new song and it was a standalone single and something that is you know their first set of new music in two plus years um it was yeah it was super nerve-wracking but what was funny was and and it's not like anything went wrong that day the day went really smooth and everything it was just how it how it was at the time but the funny thing was after that panic attack that night the rest of the week it was like i just needed that freak out moment of holy crap i'm doing like a, a big project and you know these guys are just humans they're not like ridiculous people by well they're ridiculous but in their own ways but like um you know it's it's not it's not so you know they're not some crazy superstars that i'm i need to be nervous about this is a total natural thing they're digging it i'm digging it everything's going super smooth but yeah after that 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 first day was just a a nightmare for me (laughs) do you think it was uh man i can totally relate to that do you think it was like you were just getting in your head about you know, if I do well, this is going to help my career. And if I don't, then it's, you know, things are going to go bad. Was it anything yeah. like that? Oh yeah, it was totally that. And it was, it was like I was saying a little bit on the Redux thing as well. Like if I screw that up or if I screw this up, I'm the guy who screwed up, you know, the new version of Smile in Your Sleep, or I'm the guy who, who, who made the bad Silverstein record, you know, like, especially cause I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of the band and basically I'm a huge fan of the band from the time that you started and you set a pretty high bar in terms of like where that band start, you know, evolved into. So it's, it's letting it's, I I just didn't want to let anybody down at the end of the day, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate with. Yeah. I appreciate that. I remember feeling the same, like for me, I think it was, I kind of like started freaking out. Yeah. I think it was the same thing. Like after the second day I had done like a whole bunch of pre-production with them and then we went to record, at a bigger studio in Toronto to do the drums. And yeah, at first, like I just tried to do too much. I tried to make it too complicated. And at the end of the first day, I was like, Oh my gosh, like I'm not qualified to do this. You know, what am I doing? And then you know, by the yeah. time we finished drums there on the third day, I was like, Oh yeah, I like totally, I got this kind of thing. But you know, I, I can totally relate to that. And yeah, being um, just the pressure of, you know, it is just different with like a local band or even another sign band. Maybe it's a band that just got signed and they're just doing their first or even second record, but like, man, this band's been around for a long time. This was their 10th studio album. Like, I feel like yeah. that just like the fans who have been following them, like they're, they're diehards. Right. And they've had one of the longest 
lasting careers in this genre. So like you said, like you don't, you want to make sure that you continue and uphold that. So what did you do? I'm curious to prepare at a, ahead of this album. So after burn it down, I, I, I felt I was pretty well prepared, but I ended up just kind of, um, when demos started rolling in, just listening to them and trying to see, you know, the nice thing is they, especially with Paul Mark, he's a really focused guy. He knew a lot of what he wanted going into it and we'd worked together in the past. So he always said, he always said, he's like, I, I make these decisions in these demos based on how you would make a decision because we'd made so many things together at that point. Um, so I was teetering this line of, I want to do more, but I can tell that my influence was already there in the, in the demo stage. Um, so just, I was preparing for them. It's funny. I was preparing for them saying no to ideas because of how well thought out everything was. And I was preparing to sort of, you know, with every band I work with, whenever, whenever I, I change something that's pretty big, I generally explain myself as I do it. And I, I tell them, you know, this is why the song is bigger, blah, blah, blah. But those don't always work when you're working with bigger bands. Cause especially like you said, their 10th record, you know, they've got an idea in mind. They're pretty headstrong on it. And I just wanted to make sure that I was going in, prepared to work with them as much uh, and not and not as much for them because I was definitely worried about that as well like I would just go in and basically be a glorified engineer for most of the record and I, I didn't want to do that you know right yeah you want to feel like you want to feel like you're contributing right and even though they've had such a long career you're still you still have a seat at the table right exactly yeah yeah did you what, what did the pre-production process look like Oh, it was awesome. So we, we did the whole, the whole record at, uh, union sound, which is like, you've been to union, right? You did the yeah. kingdoms thing. So I was fortunate enough. I've never, I'd never done a record outside of my studio. I mean, I have, but not like a full length where I was like parked in another studio. So it was really comfortable. They, um, burn it down was the first time they did drums last on a project. And that's a really important thing in my productions is to be able to craft those decisions right till the end. So they were already prepared for that. But what we ended up doing with pre-pro was we had these um, six-day week, six day blocks, and the studio had to be torn down in between. But it wasn't a big deal because Darren, the engineer there, was like super good at tear down and setting things back up almost perfectly. So <clears throat> pre-production was the first week, and the plan was just going through all the songs, you know, trimming the excess, rearranging, working on melodies and things like that. My a big goal was to make sure as much of the lyrical content was done as possible. Um, and, and just really like dive into ideas and pre-production was interesting because we had a full drum kit set up instead of normally I'll do pre-production with MIDI drums and things like that. Uh, we had MIDI drums on the demos, but we were going back and punching ideas with a real kit and working them out. And excuse me, we ended up, um, we ended up actually tracking drums for three songs during pre-production because it just made sense. Like we'd hammered out those ideas. The drums were sounding really good. It was fun because I got to refine the drum sound every single day. What, you know, over that first week that by the time it was day, I think the first week was actually seven days. And then we took a day off. Um, by that sixth or seventh day, I had a really cool drum sound off the board all ready to go. And I wanted, and I knew that three or four of the songs were set. We weren't going to really dig in and change a lot. So I committed to tracking the drums for those in that first week. And then, you know, we ended up doing drums for the rest of them sort of later. Um, so it was fun. It was, it was total freedom in a way I hadn't had on a record before. You know, you always feel like you're crunched for time on a record. You know, most of the time I'm doing uh, four, six day weeks and I'm pumping out 10 to 12 songs and, you know, I'm crammed in my studio with five other dudes and my, you see my studio, it's comfortable, but it's, you know, five guys in there gets pretty, pretty crazy quickly. But there it just felt like uh, we could do whatever we needed to whenever we needed to. And it was really nice to have that freedom, especially in pre-production. Yeah. That's, that's such a nice, a nice way to work. That was uh, awesome. Yeah. The thing I love about this record, uh, and this is like, I think it's really cool. The connection that you have with the Harker music studio community and the course and everything and Silverstein, it's, it's just really cool. But I think the bigger reason I wanted to have you on is because I think this, this record sounds amazing i think the the production is great the mix sounds awesome it's one of the best i've heard in this genre in a couple of years to be honest and the reason i love it is to me it really hits the sweet spot between like it sounds professional it sounds like it competes against any other you know big time record out there 
it's polished, but at the same time, it doesn't sound fake. Like in this genre, especially the heavier music, it's like it, stuff now. It's just like it doesn't sound like a real drummer. It doesn't sound like a real band or anything. It's just it's just overdone. But you didn't do that. Yeah. You really found the the sweet spots. So was that for you? Is that like a conscious effort and part of the vision? Was it discussed at all, or is that just kind of automatically how you end up making music? No, it was it was by design for that record for sure. Um, it, they're easily a band that could go either direction. Like you could you could overhype the drums and make them really really like you know static, or you can keep them kind of a rocky sound. And we were talking about a lot of references for the record and things like that. And there are some stuff you know with the direction they were moving. There's some things where the drums do sound really organic, but the production is crazy. So we wanted to find the balance. And I think the one thing I said and they were all down to to agree on that, especially because they're older guys and it's their 10th record. They want a rock record. They want a record that sounds real. That was the thing. It was I wanted I wanted an organic rock sounding record in a bit of a stylized genre. And thankfully they were all like on board with that. So yeah, drums especially was a huge goal to make sure that I didn't, you know, you listen to a song like Infinite on that record, it could so easily be metalcore drums, you know, like and that I just didn't want that. I wanted it to almost be, you know, for lack of a better word, like Nickelback or Breaking Benjamin drums, you know, like where you listen to those rock records and you're not listening for how slick the production is. You're just enjoying the songs on them, you know. Um, so, yeah, that was 100 percent by design and, and something we spent a lot of time on during drum tracking, especially. Yeah, that, that's awesome to hear. I can, I can totally get that reference and that vibe. That That's kind of what I thought when I when I first heard a couple of the songs, especially like Infinite. And uh, I forget the other one, but what's the one that's like more, more out there with like more pop style? Is it uh, all on me? Yeah, yeah, all on me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was like, man, this sounds like it's it's just I could hear this on the radio, like, and not just the songs, but just like the just the the mix. Yeah, like comparing to those bands is is bang on, I think. But I love that. I think it's hard to do um, because so many rock and heavier records are overdone especially with the drums with just drums that don't they don't even sound like drums anymore it's just like yeah exactly you know and and uh yeah but because of that it's like you know when you're trying to compare and feel like you're competing with those records if you just when you're using trying to use mostly live drums it can feel like hard to get it up to that impact but i I would say you definitely nailed it man i love love the drums on this record the whole the whole thing sounds sounds awesome so yeah so with that said, why don't we dig into the mix? So I'm going to, I'm going to play a video that Sam pre-recorded for us, digging into the song Bad Habits, the first song off of Silver Scene's most recent record. So I'm going to cue that up now. And uh, after that, uh, we're going to be back on live and we'll do a few minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes, or maybe more, we'll see, of a Q&A with Sam. So as you're watching this uh, kind of mix breakdown, then write down some questions because as you're seeing, and, and Sam's bringing some stuff up, uh, you might have some questions that you want to ask about it. You might want him to go more in depth on some things, or if you've already come here with questions about the record and about his techniques and production, just yeah, stick around because we'll take those questions after. And one more thing, as we're watching this, I want you guys, anytime you see something that's like kind of like a knowledge bomb or something that is like a big aha moment for you in uh, this mix breakdown, I want you to post the bomb emoji in the chat. I'm going to post it for you so you can copy and paste it. This is, uh, that's always fun. So anytime you see something, let's say like, wow, that's sick. Or it's su- something surprising, big aha moment, post a bomb. And uh, that way we'll know what's kind of resonating for you guys. So without further ado, let's uh, dig into Sam's mix for bad habits. Hey everyone, my name is Sam Guayana. I'm a producer and mixer from Toronto, Ontario. I've worked with bands such as Silverstein, Rarity, Light Pacific, Young Culture, and a lot of other ones. And today I'm here to show you the track Bad Habits from Silverstein's new record, A Beautiful Place to Drown. I uh, produced the song and mixed it. Uh, We recorded the entire album at Union Sound Company in Toronto, which is a beautiful studio. It's like one of my favorite studios in the city. Uh, and it was a treat. It was really nice to like get into that studio, uh, just be creative the entire time. We didn't have to worry about you know deadlines or anything. We booked a lot of time there. Um, so yeah, so today the goal with this video is I'm going to go through part by part. Uh, I'm going to talk about elements from each track or from uh, each part of the song. 
uh, little tips and tricks I did and little fun things I had the opportunity to do just when the time arose. Uh, if you haven't heard the song yet, it's a really straightforward uh, Silverstein song, very rock, uh, you know, faster tempo, a little more forward. Um, and it's very just a good banging song. I'm pretty sure it opens the record and the whole goal of this song when we were working on it was just to put out this like really aggressive first song that you know punches you in the face the second you hit play. So I think most of you have heard it, but if not, I'm just going to run through a little bit of the chorus just so you can get a vibe for it. And uh, then, yeah, we'll just go through and talk about the song. Hey. Why do I keep chasing bad feelings? I keep breaking down. Very quick chorus in this song. The point of the, a lot of the songs on this record were in production were just to kind of go through, get um, you know, get the exciting ideas out and sort of move on and, and let the songs kind of build upon those things. So uh, I'm going to start with my <clears throat> master bus or, or my mix bus in this song, uh, show you a bit of my process, the things I do on a mix bus. Uh, these apply to pretty much everything I work on. I don't really change these settings too much. Sometimes I'll play around with a couple things, but for the most part, what you're seeing here is what I'm always working on. So all of my uh, all of my instruments get bussed to different buses. Uh, you know, drums to a drum bus, bass to bass, guitars, vocals, and for session management, I move all these to the end, and then all of those end up going to a mix bus. On that mix bus is usually uh, VMR running um, VCC in the mix bus mode, usually set to 4K. Sometimes I'll set it to the British Neve. But for the most part, this is my like jam when I'm working on a when I'm working on a mix. Uh, the mix bus is copied over to every main bus as well, and they're all linked together. And uh, and then usually on the master bus, if I want a little bit more of something, I'll grab this custom series equalizer and do some tricks. It's usually a last minute move. If I'm like finding a mix, you know, I'm not super stoked on the low end. I want a little bit more. I'll pump a little bit of sixty. If I uh, want a little bit of brightness, I'll go for that twelve k. Um, and then any sort of bus comp these for this one, I use the slate digital FG gray, but most of the time I'm using, uh, the BX townhouse, the plugin Alliance one these days. Uh, I find that one's a little beefier. This one's a little quicker, a little more exciting and just gets the job done when I need it. Uh, fast attack, fast release, pretty typical settings there. Uh, I definitely played around with the release release on different, uh, speeds for different songs on this record i wanted to make sure that that was sort of adapting along the whole record uh, a little bit of a high pass filter just uh so you know the super low especially if i'm adding a little bit of extra low with that uh with the vmr plugin um isn't getting attacked by that compressor so the side chain set to 60 hertz backed up on the backed up on the makeup game but that's just to sort of uh you know accommodate a uh, little bit of cleanup around the lower mids just to get rid of some sounds way later in the game I wasn't stoked on. Probably came in like a mix revision and I was like, hey, we're kind of noticing this. And I was like, all right, cool. Let me uh, let me sort of handle it by doing this. And then last in my chain is always uh, FGX. I've got, um, I've got the main compressor off and I'm using it just for like the slightest bit of leveling. I'll play that course again. You'll see here how it's just bringing the volume up more than anything. It's not really compressing or limiting. Hey. Why do I keep chasing bad feelings? I keep breaking. It's actually a tip I picked up from Jordan of just to sort of get it dynamically where I want it before moving on to uh, the actual mastering stage. All right, let's talk about some stuff. We'll start at the uh, start at the drums. So, um, one thing I like to do, you'll see right away, are these crash dubs. Uh, this is just a stereo crash. It's in there just to accent the beginning of certain parts. Instead of me going in and automating that higher, I usually just use one from the session that I have a little more control of being able to, you know, boost up when I want. Bad habits. It's funny. I always hear, I always see sessions where people do this and you never hear the crash dub volume until you finally listen back. And after you've seen it, like say in a picture of a session or something, you're like, ah, you know what? I noticed that that goes off right when that happens. So it's this little illusionary thing that is not there when you don't know about it and is completely there when you do. Um, below that, I've got my samples for the session. For this session, I sampled or I uh, ran triggers on kick snare and toms. And I'll show you why I've got two snares going on here, what one is doing and what the other one is doing. 
Um, and then a very fun thing I got to do at Union, having the opportunity to work with a bunch of crazy gear, was I printed a reverb live while we were tracking. Um, I've never had the opportunity to do this, and I always wanted to try. I, it was a, an uh, Eventide H3000 on a setting called Drew's Chamber, and uh, it was really cool. So I, I found a mix that I really liked while we were tracking of the drums, sent that to this, and then... Um, Sorry, I'm just going to turn that on in case I accidentally mute myself. Uh, sent that to this and then printed this live while we were actually tracking on the Neve console. And you'll see that's actually the only uh, drum reverb happening. This is my normal drum reverb whenever I'm loading a session. I don't know why there's two arousers on it. Um... And, uh, and I opted to just use the Drew's chamber instead of, um, instead of this, my regular reverb. I, you know, want to try something different. Uh, I got a snare verb going, a drum comp going, like a parallel drum comp, and then a couple little things happening here and there. So we'll take a quick listen to the drums on their own in uh, sort of the big parts. Um, and I'll talk, to, I'll talk a little bit about why I chose to do certain things a certain way um, in, in the drums. So let me, uh, let's go to, I'll uh, we'll just go to the chorus, take a quick listen. I love the drums on this record. I was really happy with how they came out. We did drums three different times. Um, just basically the way we structured the record, we decided to keep a drum set going the whole time. So during pre-production, we tracked three or four songs. Uh, at the end of the record, because I usually track drums last, we tracked uh, the majority of them and then did a third setup for a couple of other things here and there. This, I believe, was in the second setup of drums, so it was tracked last just because it was more of a simple song. And I was so happy with how it came out. I've got, like, you know, the mono room in it is just so tasty sounding. Far rooms, uh, the far rooms at Union are weird. I always thought I'd like them, but I didn't really, I don't ever really enjoy them when I use them. So a lot of the times I'm relying on like a, a well-placed mono to kind of glue everything together. Uh, I did a mono overhead, which I almost never do. A lot of transient in it, and it's just a good kit balancer. It's got a lot of compression on the way in. That was a very fun thing about being at Union is I was able to just play around with things like that. You can see the spank on that just print it on the way in um and then yeah so i'll talk about the drums a little bit um i opted for i almost never do single single shots but uh more and more i'm falling in love with them these days kick drum i opted for a single shot sample of just something that was kicking around in my library i like the sound of Blended that with a bit of a room as well that's going on there. Um, and then here's my little thing. Uh, sometimes I don't always want, you know, the same amount of compression on a snare drum as I do on its reverb. So when I'm making a sample blend, I'll sometimes print just a snare sample on its own and then just a reverb on its own. And that's basically what I did here. And then the uh, reverb. And, uh, you know, them together. Along with that, there is an actual snare reverb happening. I'm a bit of a creature of habit, so chances are I just left that snare reverb in. Reverb is a weird thing. Sometimes you'll add a whole ton of it to something, and it'll just kind of disappear when you're playing back. But then you take it out, and you realize that... It, you're really missing it. So I, I find, especially at snares, if you're mixing in like a room sample like I'm doing there, it doesn't hurt to have that reverb as well to just keep the sides of everything nice and wide. Uh, a couple tom samples. Uh, these are blended with the tom. So what I did was I either made these from the session or um, they were just samples that sounded really close to the original toms. And the floor. And yeah, the goal with all these samples is to blend them with the kit. I'm not always looking for full replacement, uh, which I'll show you here what the kit sounds like with and without. You'll see that there's a lot of heavy lifting happening kick and snare wise, but those toms are more just to keep consistency. Yeah, 
so a lot of the kick is sample and uh but you saw when the snares go off there it's pretty much you know it's just helping the reinforcement i love how oh man there was like no bleed coming through the snare while we were tracking so i was so excited to use a bunch of real snare super great i was really happy with that uh i did my typical things you know during editing there was no ride in the song so i turned that off there was you know one china it it's unmuted it happens same with hats and ride or same with the hats they're uh you know they're only active when they're actually being played so one thing i found i'm doing a lot these days um is time adjusting racks and floors i used to not do it as much but these days I'm doing it because um, I'm not getting enough low end just right away. And I'm wondering why. And I'm realizing that I'm having a bit of a phase discrepancy. You know, sometimes you flip the phase 180 degrees and it doesn't or it doesn't solve the problem at the end of the day. So it's it's a matter of going in and checking. And usually when I'm doing that, I'm zooming into the uh, overheads and literally just measuring the time between the hits. Um, another thing I'm really excited about on uh, on stuff I'm doing these days is clipping snares. It's, it's something I, I'm a little later to the game doing. Like, I used to not do it as much, but even here you see, like, Tapehead going pretty nuts. Tapehead's my sort of go-to one to kind of slam, uh, slam the snare. Adds a lot of weight in the context of the song there. Um, and then, yeah, there's a couple little effecty parts happening. Um, I took a drum talk back of... Paul Kohler, the drummer in the band, he had his own mic, so I, you know, I could communicate with him. And uh, for this little part that happens in the first pre-course, we wanted a little crunchier, so we've got some you know, stuff happening there. The tail end of that adds such a cool sound. I love that. And that's just Devil Lock doing its, you know, Devil Lock thing. There's literally no other plugin I can find that does what this thing does. And if you just want to destroy something maniacally, Devil Lock is the way to go. Uh, and then I think after we tracked, we wanted a hi-hat bounce in this. So I'm one of those, you know, it's there's no real rules to these things. If you don't have hi-hats, what do you do? You program them in at the end of the day. It's kind of the, what you got to do. A lot of typical moves you'll see happening when I want something sort of louder. It's you know it sounds so simple to say, but you you know you grab the fader, you turn it up. So the tail end of that has this extra bit of snare boom happening, and uh, I went in and turned the actual sample at the bottom up there, or the um, the room sample. So just little things that you you kind of accent when you're mixing to make the song sound a certain way. Um, on drums, you know. I've been really in love with Soothe these days. This is the, oh, hello. This is the first one. Uh, the second one came out after I did the record, so I didn't actually use it on there. But if you've ever, you know, it's one of these plugins, it's really expensive, but when you need it, there's nothing else that does it, and it's amazing. And it's just going in taming some, um, taming some really harsh overhead stuff. <laughs> See, it's super subtle in there, but it's literally, it's got that one job and it does that one job perfectly. Um, I'm not going to go into crazy detail about everything I'm doing to every single instrument. Um, I tend to, you know, be pretty on par with a lot of the stuff many of you guys have learned, you know, when it comes to sort of taking certain things out. Um, or, you know, I do a little bit of like compression on overheads. I want a little bit more top end. So I went in afterwards, you know, very typical sort of moves. Um, I more just want to show you the process of everything and you know talk about the decisions i made and why i made them throughout the uh throughout the song so that being said i am going to leave drums here and uh and move on um actually before i do that i'll talk about tambourines i am obsessed with tambourines i put them in every single recording ever i don't know why <laughs> so the courses of these of course have why do i keep chasing bad feelings i keep breaking down one trick I do is I um I don't have or I've got like a library of tambourine samples I've either recorded or you know downloaded over the years and instead of 
you know, doubling them because I like the idea of a little bit of a double tambourine happening. I do this trick with the doubler where I pull up Waves Doubler, I pan the real one however I want it, I turn off the second one, and I use one of them, one of the doubles just as the other pan, um, just to sort of make that second one happen. It adds just a little bit of depth and space to everything, and obviously it gets its own reverb with its own mix and uh, you know, a little bit of cleanup. But that's just more, um, I like, it's one of, it's again like I was talking about the reverb, where it's something you don't notice until it's removed, and then you would notice how dry and weird that tambo is if it's panned to one side. But if it's got this little bit of an illusion of two happening and tucked in, it all of a sudden disappears with the cymbals, disappears into the overheads, and just sounds right. And I always find I struggled placing tambourines until I started doing that. All right, so we're going to move on. Bass was really fun for this one. I used a, uh, I used the DI on the way in. I used a dark glass, which uh, a dark glass preamp, which didn't end up getting used in the final mix. And uh, and then the bass amp is actually hilariously enough a Line Six pod. Um, it was recorded into my Kemper, so it's actually cooler looking than a Line Six pod. But it's exactly this tone called Pawn Shop Punk that was in uh, my Line Six pod that I ended up modifying over the years to kind of suit. So P bass, which is you know the thing I always do. It's the bulk of the tone, and then the DI comes in to kind of just round it out, add a lot of low end, give me the actual bit of DI. And I don't know if you've ever used this, but the TSE BOD is a free plugin, and I can't believe it's free. It's literally 90% of my bass tone on almost every record I do. Uh, just this free plugin and a little bit of compression, uh, and you know, you basically got exactly what I go for when I go for a bass tone. Um, I track bass really aggressively on the way in. It's just part of the sound, in my opinion. Uh, let me see. And I could probably just stay here. Um, I'll kill this stuff quick. We'll take a quick listen. Oh, I'll talk about the time adjuster in a sec, too. A lot of that is just part of my sound. Um, I find bass is different than guitars. Guitars, you know, you get a lot of distortion. You can really hide a lot of blemishes. On bass, even when you've got a lot of distortion happening, the more even it goes into that distortion or it goes into an amp sim, the more um, the more aggressive it sounds, the more exciting it sounds. So I just sort of adopted that habit of really slamming tracks or slamming bass tracks on the way in and really hearing that pick attack and everything like that. Uh, so the time adjuster is here to phase align with the bass amp. It took me literally forever to figure out, and I think that might have been one of the reasons I ended up bailing on the dark glass at the end of the day was I was just having too much of an issue of making them all work. Um, but yeah, so I'm just time shifting one of the tracks to work with the other track at the end of the day. I'm pinning it down with the, the arouser. Oh, I should talk a little bit about the drum bus. I'll come back to that. Uh, pinning it down with the arouser, which uh, is sort of my go-to bass guy these days, especially if I, if I track on the way in with an 1176, I will use the arouser on uh, on it during mixing. And I do that with everything. If I track a vocal with an 1176, the arouser plugin gets the vocal in the mix. If I track a vocal with a distressor, the usually CLA-76 is the uh, 1176 plugin that makes it. Um, and then on bass, I'm, do, I'm always doing a lot of carving, and that's just to make it fit in with the kick drum, fit in with everything. I don't actively think about these things. I just sort of, it became a habit. And then when I, you know, fell into the habit of certain bass tone, I just go for certain moves that need to work right away. So we'll take a listen to this quick. You see the second that EQ comes on that bass tone, like, you know, the bass tone without the EQ sounds pretty solid. But the second you pop that EQ on, all of the problems that might be there are completely gone. And it's a subtle thing. It's not something you always notice when you're listening back with everything, but it really is, you know, sort of satisfying to know that I'm not having any problems with the bass guitar at the end of the day. Yeah, I meant to talk about this drum bus a little bit, so I'll come back to it. So after I'm doing a lot of my work, um, I will do a broad stroke EQ like a Neve or something on a drum bus. 
usually to give myself a lot of extra top end if I want a little bit of grind coming from that 3K range um, and then a little bit of extra low end there. And those are pretty typical moves I do on uh, drum bus. It's just solving a problem in a broad stroke way as opposed to going in and trying to figure it out. If I know that I just need a little bit of this or a little bit of that, that's sort of the solution at the end of the day. I'm gonna play this back. These are sort of my arouser settings for drum bus. Uh, they tend to change. They're either 1.5 or 4. On this record, I wanted a bit more of an aggressive drum sound, so I opted to do the 4 to 1. You really hear it bring out the snare when it popped back on there. You really hear it kind of like squeeze everything into place and just become way more exciting. Uh, and then JST Clip is here, barely doing anything. I think, yeah, 1.5, and then this is minus, yeah. Uh, just holding those really ridiculous peaks in place. They usually happen from floor, uh, floor toms or things like that. And this is there almost as a safety net at the end of the day, more than for its actual sound. Uh, and then I think, yeah, I probably just wanted to do a little bit more. Grabbed this, decided to, you know, scoop out a little bit and keep rolling with the drums. So that's drum and bass. I love how they play together. It's a really important thing in most of my mixes to have uh, drum and bass just be speaking to each other. So I decided while we were tracking this record that I really wanted to use amps. I'm very much an amp sim guy these days, but it was really important. Uh, we had a lot of fun gear. We had a lot of cool stuff. It was really important to at least try to use an amp. So while we were tracking, I did this blend from the board of a 57 and a, uh, was it a 421? No, a 57 and an Apex ribbon right on the console, one track into Pro Tools. So I didn't have to, you know, deal with the blend later. I really hate multi-miking stuff, but I, you know, I liked the sound of it a little bit better, so I rolled with it. So I've got these guitar tones. Really happy with the tone. I wasn't bummed, but when I started mixing the song, I found I was lacking the sort of excitement that I wanted out of it. So I ended up dropping in the DIs as well with uh, STL Tonality, such a great plugin. I used just this on a lot of records last year, like no amp, nothing, just STL Tonality as my main rhythm tone. And as mixing went along throughout the record, I realized that I liked that tone more than the one I really worked on getting, that I basically just used that other one as this mid forward push, and I used the uh, STL tonality tone as an actual uh, you know, main focus on the record. So these settings here are a lot of things I just tend to do to most guitars. You'll see that they're very similar along both the amp and the amp sim tone. These are just cleanup jobs, you know, at the end of the day, you go through, take a listen to what sort of sucks and get rid of it, you know, remove the extra fizz and things like that. I tend to remove a lot around here on a lot of guitars. Um, sometimes I'll dynamically remove it instead of just straight up take it out. And that's just so it lets the, the super low mid of the bass kind of grind through a little bit better at the end of the day. These are frequencies I find we don't really hear in guitars uh, in the context of a whole mix. So if it's, you know, if it's not needed, I'd rather just kind of get rid of it. And that's what I did. Uh, funny enough, when I was talking about phase relation, I found no phase relation problems dropping these amp sims on with the real tracks. I actually love how the blended guitar tone sounds. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, adding in that real amp really brings in the, the exact hair I kind of wanted on the track at the end of the day. Um, in the intro... And only in the intro, this is a production thing. I've got these tracks going on. In the intro, in over the solo and over the solo outro, but it was too aggressive to happen in choruses, so that was a production decision where we decided to, you know, kill them when choruses happen, bring them back 
uh, when there's just guitars happening. And it was something we, if you listen to the record closely, you hear it across the entire record, this extra thickness of just left and right octave guitars happening. And they're not octaves as in like octave riffs as much as they're just these beefy low guitars. They were a last minute addition. I think they were either a bass six or an actual baritone tuned down. And just, we went through and everywhere we wanted to beef something up, we did it. And these are actually amp tones, I'm pretty sure too. It was really important in the production of this whole album to really make this big guitar record. Um, Silverstein are like a very real band, even though they're a little, you know, they've got their overproduced moments for sure, which I love doing. I love mixing. I wanted to keep this just exciting bite that's been established in a lot of their records in the past. And, um, and those low guitars were kind of, kind of that like glue that held everything together. <clears throat> so for a lot of other things on this record, uh, I tended to, I tended to use amp sim as well. Like I said, I'm not a big amp fan. I wanted the main rhythms to be amp, but I wanted basically everything else to be, you know, just at my discretion at all times. <laughs> I use gain reduction on that little lo-fi guitar. Gain reduction is such a fun plugin. It, everybody always thinks it's just for vocal, but it, it has its like use in drum parallels, in um, in you know here I'm using it as a lo-fi on a guitar. It's got such aggression to it, and it just brings everything right to the front of the mix and right when you need to solve a problem. And these little crunchy tones, which end up making it on a lot of the record. Um, I think these actually came from pre-production. It is, it's the tone that happens in every pre-chorus and it's just waves guitar. <laughs> um, and then this guy, this is a little secret tool I've been doing a lot. I do it on backing vocals a lot these days. I do it on, um, I do it basically on anything I want this weird random crunch. I'll just pull this plug-in up. I won't even touch the EQs, although this one I wanted a bit of uh, brightness by the look of it, but I'll just touch the drive knob. That alone does so much to the tone. It's awesome. It's so cool on vocals, on stereo backing vocals too. And it gets really crazy. There, I just cranked it for fun. It gets really crazy. kind of dig that i wish i kept it that cranked in the real mix <clears throat> um for the leads so i uh i think we did all these leads kemper and i was just playing around with different ideas for these leads one of the things was we stereoed them with this little quarter note dot happening on one side and quarter note just to add some space to it And we also did a middle one, and this only happens just like with the heavy guitars. It only happens when vocals aren't there and when the, the riff on its own is the sort of the, you know, melody. This is a really cool lead. If you notice, the guitars aren't doing, you know, rhythmy things. They're also doing high sort of register stuff. So these leads were sort of the voice in these parts. And that's just there, it's just there to, you know, solve the missing thing. The vocals missing production wise, cool. Bring in an element that can sort of fill that space. Um, we have uh, Aaron from Intervals on this song. He is a, if you know anything about Aaron, he is probably one of the most talented musicians on earth. And, um, he, we talked about different drafts. We sent some drafts back and forth in terms of solo, what we wanted. He ripped out this unreal solo in a matter of like half a day and uh, recorded it and sent it our way. And he sent me the dry tracks to reamp, but I loved, he's such a tone junkie, even though he's, I know he used a plugin on this. He's so good at it that I just opted to use the, basically what he sent me as like the solo tone at the end of the day. Uh, 
and then he comes back playing sort of a counter melody to the vocal. One of the nice things about um, using his stem instead of just rolling with it is I ended up just chopping off the, the delay tail at the end of it when I didn't need it. And we got the bees. They're literally called bees because they sound like bees and I'm gonna show you what they sound like right now. These were literally just to cause chaos at the end of the song. When you listen to the end of this song, it goes nuts. There isn't really a vocal. The chorus never doubles in this song. So the idea is, hey, we've got Aaron coming back. We've got everything else. Can we just make a wall of noise? And uh, if you look, because I think it's on another rail. Yeah, I've got these one knobs happening here, all doing different automation, all happening, just going nuts at the end. <laughs> And they actually do that little step sequence thing at the end of the song that happens over the last vocal. You don't really hear them in the mix, they just cause some chaos, but at the end they, to me, were an important production move. Bad habits. Happening right behind Shane's vocal there is really cool. So that's guitars. Um, I don't really do a lot of reverbs on guitars or anything special like that unless the part specifically needs it. Then I'll go in. I've got this guitar delay that I showed you. That's just to sort of thicken that lead and things like that. Um, vocals are really fun. It's funny. <clears throat> I expected something else when I opened this session because a lot of this uh, album, I ended up using gain reduction on Shane's vocals just as the main compressor. But um, I guess in this song, I didn't. And I think it's because I'm actually distorting his vocals a little bit more. Yeah, I've got a decapitator going. I'll, show, I'll talk about the, the vocal bus in a sec. Um, one thing that happens is when I'm tracking vocals, a lot of the times I'm using CLA vocal as a sort of just like a quick start, let's get rolling, let's get tracking some vocals. <clears throat> and I loved how the tight reverb sounded. It was perfect for the record. It was exactly what I wanted happening. So instead of spending time setting up like an extra verb bus or anything like that, I just have this is basically the main reverb on the entire album. Um, and then a little bit of stereo spread that happens, which is just nice to help get a vocal tucked in. So I'm gonna play a little bit of this on its own. I'm gonna talk about a few little things I decided to do on this vocal because it's um, you know, just like with the reverb thing, distortion is one of those things that you can sneak onto a vocal and it kind of disappears in a mix. But when you listen to it on its own, it all of a sudden, you know, pops out at you. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. But I don't care what anyone says. It's just me and my demons left. I believe in all my doubts. Yeah, it's interesting how that decapitator just kind of blends in and it's just doing a little bit of work. It's it's doing a little important job. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed, but I don't care what anyone says. You can actually hear when I killed that decapitator there, there was a lot of distortion still happening. And I believe it's probably because just like with the bass guitar, I track these vocals pretty aggressively on the way in. Um, so I'm gonna actually play these without anything on them for a sec. Bye bye everybody. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed, but I don't care what anyone says. It's just me or my day red left. Trusty SM7. It's like the best microphone on chain. He it just works for him. A lot of the times I've used. Uh, when we did some other uh, stuff, I used my 87 on him, and I just found that he's the SM7 guy. Um, that room's a little interesting. It had it, We recorded in a big room. We did the vocals in a big room, too. We built a little booth, but we still had the occasional bit of problems. So, I, you know, this is more of a problem-solve EQ at the end of the day. You'll hear right away a lot of the, like, mud disappear and things like that. I know this is how I get... I take a small thing and get obsessed, but I don't care what anyone says. It's just me or my day red left. I hate de -essers. I struggle with them a lot and I don't know why. So one of the things I did on this was a dynamic EQ, which is basically what a de is doing, just in uh, one spot. So instead of going and pulling up a de plug plugin, I just sort of went in with this band and solved that problem there. Uh, the arouser, like I said, I tracked this with, this, with uh, an 1176 on the way in. So the arouser is sort of my like, go to in that situation when I 
want extra compression on the vocal. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. But I don't care what anyone says. It's just me and my day bridge left. If you've ever used a real distressor, you know you can slam the hell out of them and they always sound good. And this is no exception. If you see how much gain reduction is actually happening when I'm doing that, that vocal still sounds so perfect and just sits in. Uh, and a little bit of spit, the old L1 trick. I know all you guys know this one. It's literally catching just the peaks. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. But I don't care what anyone says. Why not? Why not get a little bit more grind out of everything? Am I doing anything special on the main? No, nothing on the VMR. So yeah, so Decapitator's first in the chain, which is bringing out a lot of aggression on those vocals. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed, but I don't care what anyone When I do use a de it's this one, and it's this just right on the vocal bus de that I tweaked a little bit. It's literally a preset built in. It's awesome. It does a perfect job. Um, I only use it on buses because it tends to take up a lot of power, even though my computer these days can handle it. I think at the time I was mixing this record, the computer couldn't handle it. Um, yeah, back to the CLA vocals, just this quick little tight room. The tight room thing is sort of like that uh, really short delay that Jordan uses in a lot of stuff where it's just there to, you know, it's gone without it, but it's adding that little space. It's just that I wish that I knew what the setting was so I didn't have to nerdily use CLA, but, uh, you know. It's the perfect reverb, so why not use it? I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. And then just a little bit of cleanup. You know, you, you add all these things on. You add Decapitator, which is a, an aggressive distortion. You add the CLA vocals, which, you know, a reverb has a little bit of low-end buildup and things like that. So this is just in there to solve those problems. It's just a bit of a cut at a couple different spots. I know this is how I get. I take a small... I found it was still really boomy on the vocals, so I ended up uh, having this band here be dynamic, and it's only happening on the spots where it really needs to. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. And then this is a late to the game addition. Uh, it's adding a bit of slap to the whole mix, which is being automated in certain spots. Um, and it's just there to add a little bit more grit, a little bit more distortion, glue that vocal in. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. One thing I was really stoked I did in this song, and I don't do it often, I, I just, I wanted, you know, like I said, this is the banger, it opens the record, it's very aggressive. I double track the vocals through the verses, which I never do, but this really tight double track just glues the vocal gives it this like super crazy aggression right away. You're not waiting for, you know, a double or a triple in a chorus to happen. You're getting fed excitement right from the get go. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed, but I don't care what anyone says. And since I didn't really, the, the double didn't really matter to me as much as the main did. Um, Probably when I pulled in my template and had the CLA 76, I just left it on. I'm not super particular. I, it didn't need to be the same settings or things like that. Although I found that the CLA 76 brought up the room a lot. So this is a little trick I use, which is this SPL D-verb plugin. And it literally just removes reverb. I know this is how I get. Hard to show when there's a reverb happening. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. You hear it on those longer words. It ends up disappearing at those little spots. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get obsessed. But I don't care what anyone says. It's I'm not always a fan of stereo harmonies, but I felt super awkward when I ended up getting that mono double happening in the verse that I just opted to sort of do stereo harmonies throughout the song. Uh, anywhere I wanted a bigger scream, I would just do stereo screams as a little production thing. Um, and then, you know, in this uh, pre-chorus here, we've got some stuff happening that's just left and right vocals, and I use those tracks as well to do those things. Back to a party house. So this sort of little talked vocal that happens underneath the scream. I pay for my mistakes, I get them for free. The goal with that was to make it as creepy and eerie as possible. So I think the altar boy here is disabled. Yeah, I'm going to turn it on for a sec. The altar boy is 
changing, yeah, changing the pitch and the formant a little bit. And I ended up printing that down and then um, running all these things. And then Real ADT, which is one of my favorite plugins for fake doubles, I actually just tossed on the double on this preset called Two Driven Vocals, which is just a bunch of extra distortion, um, giving it this really eerie sound that you don't really focus on, but it adds a, like a, a layer to the actual part. Why pay for my mistakes? I get them for free. Just a little creepy sounding, a little spooky. You know, some spooky stuff. Why not? Do I keep chasing bad feelings? I keep breaking down and never deal with it. Never deal with it. Oh, those throws. Let's talk about these throws quick. I just want a big old distorty throw. So what I do with these things is I'll copy the vocal I want over. Exact same time and everything. You can see it's the same vocal. Do the effect I want. Instead of placing it over, I'll, you know, just set the echo boy to one full note. Make the noise I want happen, and then boom. It auto pans while it happens too, just to not be in anybody's way. And um, yeah, I mean, that's basically the core of the main vocals. I want to talk a little bit about some fun things I did in the vocals too. Uh, these intro vocals were just different takes of the chorus that I have, happen to pop in and affect differently. I keep chasing bad feelings. I keep breaking down and never deal with it. Drunk as I don't want to swim. I'm good with bad habits. Oh, yeah, sneaking in a little, uh, little hip hoppy low vocal. Bad habits. A little altar boy that happens on, I don't think it happens every hook, but it happens on important hooks. Good with bad habits. And that's just to give this a little, again, that little eerie vibe. It's this weird mix of like this crazy aggression, but still stylistic decisions happening throughout the song. Um, and yeah, Paul Mark sings in this song. Aside from, you know, a couple songs, uh, or aside from, I think, that one jam, he doesn't really sing on a lot of stuff. And it was a decision we decided to make that, you know, there's a lot of features on this record, but it was more important to just feature someone else in the band who's clearly able to deliver a part instead of, you know, go hunt for a feature. And uh, back with the whole eerie vibe, I, I did some cool, fun things to this. Let's talk about Paul Mark's vocal quick here. I keep chasing bad feelings. I keep breaking down and never wanted to quit. Because I'm good with it. I keep so one quick thing I did was, again, real ADT, set kind of, or set to the same setting to give me a bit of drive fake double lowered on purpose that's just there to be eerie but not too obvious i keep chasing bad feelings i keep breaking down and never wanted to quit because i'm good with it really subtle in there just sort of tickling doing you know doing just a little bit of stuff there happening again at the ending down and never deal with it Shout just i don't want to swim i'm good with yeah, you hear more of the real ADT effect at the end of that. This plugin, actually, I'm going to talk about it in a sec. This plugin is so good. If you've got a single vocal, like a single backing vocal or something, and you want to double it, hey, I wish this part had a stereo double or, or stereo harmonies. It is a fairly convincing stereo doubler in a much better way than uh, than most other things I found. Like, I don't really like Waves Doubler too much, but real ADT will do the job. So when Shane's vocal comes in here, they're riffing off each other. They're not supposed to line up, but I wanted... Paul Mark's vocal to be wider and to be a little more doubled. So I ended up here. I'll play them, play them together. Then I'll talk about what I did. I keep chasing bad feelings. I keep breaking down and never deal with it. Drown cause I don't want to swim. I'm good with. So I wanted him just, you know, tucked in below Shane, but doing his little embellishments here and there. And I wanted a stereo. So pull up real ADT. Two driven vocals, which is just a preset, sounds super great. Although change the pan to full, I think that's one of the things that's not set up. I keep chasing bad feelings. I keep breaking down and never deal with it. Down because I don't want to swim. It's you know you obviously notice it's kind of the same vocal being manipulated when you listen in solo, but in the context of a song, it really just does sound like a straight up double vocal. I keep chasing bad feelings. I keep breaking down and never deal with it. Drown cause I don't wanna swim. I'm good with bad habits. We had a big ol' 
swell vocal. This is this was fun. I think I just automated that. I you know a bunch of reverb, automated or a bunch of reverb and a delay panning back and forth, and then just uh, you know raising the volume of it. Bad And then it gave me a little bit of a way to sort of swell back in as well. The ending has so much, so many lead things happening, whether it's like a lead vocal or like a lead guitar or something like that. And they're all competing with each other, but I think the point was for everybody to sort of get out of their way. So I've got these vocals on the side, I've got Aaron Solo down the middle, I've got Paul Mark creeping right back in just to say a couple little things, and it's this really fun little vibe of like, after, I think we ended up, that bees thing I ended up talking about ended up happening after all these vocals, I think, because it was it was this way of just causing chaos in the end of the song until it just cuts and it's over. <laughs> Yeah, I think initially the song ended with that Bad Habits on its own, and I wanted to add that little extra that happens from the guitar. Just so it's not a typical, like, end sort of the song. You know, it's got this, like, pretty little trail. And I love, I just love how that song becomes chaos right till the end of it. We'll take one more quick listen there. I'm, I'm going to play right from the, uh, right from when it starts to go nuts. <laughs> And I mean, production-wise, that's a lot of the how I make my decisions in the song. Um, I will talk a little bit quickly about uh, making space for every element in the song. I tend to um, have, you'll see over here, there's these different groups. There's inst and mix. And inst is just literally, oh, right. Inst is just literally these instrumentals, and then mix is with the vocal. So what I'll start by doing is when I've got all my levels ready to go in a song, all these are, I try to keep the drums at uh, zero as a reference and then everything else I, you know, sort of scoop around that. Then I'll just go through and, you know, automate chunks down at a time so they're not hitting the bus compressors hard and they're being a little more loose. So verses tend to dip in volume. I know this is how I get. I take a small thing and get up. It's just me. You know, right there, I want a little bit more excitement, so I ended up boosting that up. Um, and then the sort of build of this part here into the pre-chorus. You hear those guitars open up, so I ended up actually raising the volume of the guitars while that happens. I'm running back. All of these moves are generally like one to two db max just to sort of build space yeah so like one and a half db there bring it back up a little bit where this says that huh, anyways i think it's about one. Oh no then what's this one what's the point there that's super strange um you know just little things like that along the way uh bringing it down when the big compressed drums come in because they're super loud you know just to compensate for the difference in volume That's sort of what I do. I'll, oh, hello, Shane. Uh, it's sort of something I'll just do while going through the mix. So I'll go through, I'll do the sort of static group where the drums, guitar, bass are all together, making all those changes. And then when things need to happen on their own, like that little raise there or this little dip down here to make more space. In fact, you see the guitars get quiet here where everything else stays up. It's because way more guitars ended up coming in at that part in the song. So it was important to make you know, the space for everything and more important by not having the guitars just blare out everything else. And 
then the vocals will get done last. I'll go through, after all my leveling's done, I mean, a lot of my vocal automation tends to happen when I'm just uh, tracking, you know, like I've got doubles here, I've got a triple in the chorus, I've got extra vocals, so you know, oops. So, you know, they're doing their thing where they're building themselves up automatically, and okay, well, I need them a little bit louder. Cool, I'll boost them up. Well, I want the verses a little quieter. Cool, I'll pull them down. And then just kind of go through. I tend to do, sort, do these sort of broad strokes automation moves, and then I'll only go in and do you know stuff that really needs to be fixed if I hear that it's happening. So in a song like this where it was really straightforward, I didn't feel that and I needed as much movement, especially with the way I build a production. So you know, dipping this line down here, little moves like that are just things I'll go through the entire song and you know, I, I noticed the solo started disappearing here, so I turned just, you know, that element up on its own. I keep chasing bad feelings. I keep... And that's sort of the that's sort of the trick with these little parts where you wanna you wanna sort of accentuate what needs to happen. That's that like extra ten percent that makes the mix go from, you know, oh, that's a really great mix to oh I love that element all of a sudden that you didn't really think about at the time. Bad habits you know, bringing the rooms up so that fills more exciting. I think I do it at the end of this fill. Oh, one thing I didn't talk about. Ah, oh, on the bass, a little freaky little trick. I've got this distortion bus that only comes in just for certain parts of the song. So I'll play without it and with it. And just there to kind of, you know, you know, sludge up the rest of the song with everything else happening. It tickles, it tickles its way back in the ending there, but it's, you know, just barely happening. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's sort of, that's basically kind of my whole process with everything when I'm working on a song. You know, I'll... I'll make my static mix. I'll get everything where I like it. I've, you know, I, I'll make my decisions on compression. I'll make my decisions on all those things. Listen back. And, you know, I, I usually do this by looping a chorus. So I'll loop the chorus, make everything sound great to that chorus, and then just kind of build backwards throughout the rest of the song. And then my final move is, you know, going in and, uh, and doing this sort of finer automation. Right at the tail end, I tend to draw down at the last moment a little fade. This happens on all my mixes. <laughs> And you can't really hear it, but it's uh, it's just there. So when I'm actually printing the oops, when I'm printing the file, it's you know dead, 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 dead silence at that exact last point. Um, I'm actually gonna talk about this quickly here. This is something I do in a lot of my mixes too. I will set up my bus to automatically be sending a um, a print and a master at the same time. So when a band wants here, the Pro L2 will come on, making up the gain. Um, and when a band wants a copy that's a little louder, it automatically prints in the session at the same time. I, I just arm both of these, hit record, and then what's happening is I'm getting both an unmastered one, so say the band's like, hey, the mix is ready to go. Boom, this one goes off to mastering, and this one uh, usually goes to the band for prep. But these days I've been sending, uh, or for recall stuff, but these days I've been sending both to bands just so they have the option to hear how it's gonna sound pre-master. I found that's something that a lot of bands are asking for these days. And it's not a hefty master or fake master, it's just there to kind of lift everything up a little bit. So, you know, I have that set up, um, you know, sending to the print track and then pre-fader to the master just so um, when I'm hitting record, it actually records to that track instead of, because I keep them muted obviously in my session. And then it's as easy as just exporting that, you know, command option K. Uh, well, usually I'll, I'll name them, but you know, and then exporting it, picking how I want it exported and sending it out. Um, so yeah, so that is Bad Habits by Silverstein. Um, if you guys have any questions about certain things, uh, Jordan and I are doing a Q&A right after this. And uh, yeah, thanks for checking this out. I want to, again, thank Jordan for having me. And uh, I, hope we can, uh, I hope we can do a lot more of this soon. Uh, thanks so much, guys. See ya. Boom. All right, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. Tons of, uh, tons of cool tricks, takeaways, lots of cool production decisions, effects, and everything. I feel like I've probably got like 10 questions <laughs> 
for you about stuff that I saw, but I'm going to leave it to uh, everyone in the chat here. I know some questions already came in. So you guys in the chat, uh, just keep typing your questions in there and uh, I'll try to pick as many as I can and throw them over to Sam. So I know that uh, we had one, well, let's just pick one that's right there already. So Nick saying, uh, speaking of automation and making space, do you have an opinion on hard panning the guitars in a course versus panning it less in a verse? Do you ever do that? Um, I'll, I'll probably hard pan like 99% of the time, especially when it's rhythm guitars and things like that, they'll get their left and right space on their own. And then, um, when it comes to, when it comes to verses or things, this one's kind of a bad example. I don't think I did it in that song, but, uh, you know, that verse drops down to one palm guitar. Sometimes I'll shift the panning of that in a little bit just so it doesn't feel so staticky to one side. Um, but if I'm going for the idea of it being like just nothing but one guitar on one side, I'll leave it at that. Or sometimes I'll solve that with a reverb where I'll keep the guitars panned, but I'll kick a reverb, like a small room that uh, the panning is swapped. So you feel it kind of just fill the space and not be like just locked to one ear. So, yeah, it's it's always part dependent, like production dependent. But uh, for the most part, it's uh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that pretty often. Cool. All right, simple question here. Do you remember if you tracked the SM7 with a high-pass filter or presence boost on? No, I'm pretty sure I didn't. I might have with the uh, with the high-pass filter on. Sorry, I'm just going to move a little bit. I might have with the high-pass filter on, but not with the presence boost. I don't really like the presence boost on the SM7. It's just a little too much or just not. And it, it's weird because it's like a vocal mic, but it, in my opinion, boosts at a spot I don't really like boosting on a vocal. So I'll try to do without usually. Yeah, agree with that. Uh, here's one. Do you do mastering yourself? Uh, I will if the project calls for it, but I really try not to. Um, I get so attached to a mix at times. I don't want to master it, especially when I know that there's a guy out there who can do like you know a ten a job ten times better than I can. I'd rather just leave it to a professional. Plus, mastering is fairly affordable these days. So, yeah, I'll totally. Do like that. What do you think is for you having worked with other guys mastering your mixes what what makes a good master for you like like when are you happy with it um i'm really happy so so i i'll listen to that l2 one that's in my mix that i was talking about uh, i'll be really happy with a master when my dynamics aren't changed much from that version but on first listen i'm noticing a freshness to it that i didn't notice before like i'm not looking for anything overhyped i'm looking for basically um an untouched but noticeably improved version of my mix. Yeah, awesome. All right, Leviathan is asking, at what stage in the mix do you dial in the settings for your buses, like drum bus compression, VTM settings, etc.? cetera? Uh, drum bus compression will come in pretty early on. Uh, it'll come in when I've basically got the samples decided because I tend to find even if they're not the loud or not the not the samples, but the close mics uh, and samples decided because I'll notice that the drum bus affects that the most. I'll start with the setting I normally start with, which is like a medium attack, fast release on a distressor plugin, um, and then just play with the input and output until I've got the desired amount of compression I want. But yeah, usually when the the most transient stuff is decided in the drums is when I'll drop in and make bigger moves on the uh, on the drum bus. Awesome. All right, Giovanni's got a good question here. Uh, I wanted to hear this as well. Uh, why do you dr track drums last? Just preference, depend on project, is it always? Can you walk us through that decision? Um, it, it's it's more of a uh, recent thing I started, probably about two or so years ago. I started noticing a lot of the times bands will come in with songs without vocals written. And um, I'll start, we'll start on the project, we'll start talking about it. Uh, almost everybody has the ability to demo these days. So I'm getting pretty solid demos as well. Usually MIDI drums or like a, a you know, a well-recorded drum kit in their basement or whatever. Um, we'll listen to the song, we'll make the changes, but for some reason people tend to leave vocals last, which drives me nuts. Cause it's like the most important part of the song. Um, it's without a doubt, I'll find if I track drums first, we'll write a vocal that would be way cooler with a pause in it or with a pause in the music or, um, you know, changing a, a vocal pattern where I wish the kick drum sort of accented that. And those decisions don't get made sometimes until three quarters of the way through a record. 
So I want to be able to basically pre-pro the record right up to the point we track drums. And had I had more time, like a record like this, when I mentioned earlier in this, you know, two or three songs were decided to the point that I knew nothing needed to happen. So we tracked drums for them right away. But I, I knew that stuff was going to evolve throughout the record. So it made more sense to, it makes more sense to basically, you know, the rhythm, the rhythmic part is the most, the rhythmic and the vocal part are the most important parts of the record to me. So it makes sense for me to have those as locked in as possible. And if I can, if I can avoid any sort of problems where I'm mangling the recorded drum kit afterwards or whatever, I'll, I'll basically do that. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Really, really cool approach. Uh, David's asking when dealing with lots of distorted guitars, how do you balance between being muddy or being harsh and brittle? Um, I'll always take muddy over harsh and brittle because muddy kind of sucks up a little bit of a frequency range that is easier to clean up, especially for like a mastering engineer or something. But I find harsh and brittle is annoying all the time. Um, it always hurts. It's always something I reach for right away when I'm making a mix decision. Like you'll see if I pull up different EQs and things like I'm notching on a lot of things where I, that I find harsh, but I'm not always, you know, rolling something off because the low end buildup isn't bothering me as much per se as, uh, as something else. So, the balance is, you know, it, it is tough to find that balance, but I'll generally deal with muddiness over dealing with, or like I'll, I'll, I'll live with muddiness more than I'll live with a harsh part. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I'll generally just do it like that. Cool. All right. Frank is asking, I get, I get all the retracking to hone in on the sound of the big band, like silver scene, but is that something you would do with smaller slash new bands? So I think what he's getting at here is like, you know, you can see in this session, there's tons of, there's tons of effort and thought into, into this, you know, retracking things, maybe working out production ideas and stuff like, so what's your take on that as so, you know, we talked at the beginning of the stream about your journey coming from just recording local bands up to this point. I'll just let you speak to this question. Does he mean retracking as in like adding stuff later or? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really sure, um, Frank. Maybe you can clarify. Let, it might be hard, but I'm. I think maybe like, means like like layering. Yeah, yeah, maybe layering. Um, and I think like maybe even what you were just talking about with like kind of working on the drums, but knowing that they might change later. So going back and like re redoing that after. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, just I think underneath the question is maybe just like, you know, the extra effort between just a young local band versus. Uh, kind of a sign band like this is this is there a difference in how you approach it or not uh not as much i, I say probably earlier in my career there was a bit of a difference just because there was more time when doing a bigger record than doing like a local band but these days especially not as much i mean i'm i'm trying my best to not be a producer stepping all over a lot of stuff like i don't like to i don't like to write a part unless i really have to or um you know i don't want to i don't want to write the song for the band but what i do want is the ability to inject a fresh idea, even if it comes later in the game. So if we're all sitting together, you know, and we realize, like I was sort of saying with tracking drums last, if I realize that something could be way better without it or something, you know, adding a new guitar part in will act like this is such a cool vocal melody. We just wrote it. How sick would this be to, um, to add a, a guitar doing that too? I'm definitely going to do that. Cause at the end of the day, even if I cut it, at least I have that option, you know? All right, um, Patty is asking, very interested in the octave guitar. Yeah, I was going to ask this too. Um, well, for his question is, was that an afterthought or were they in baritone tuning or bass six tuning? Uh, and I wanted to also add to that, which, like what were you using to get that effect? Was it a pedal or is that just, were you using an octave pedal? Uh, oh, in that song, I think it might have been an octave pedal. I'm pretty sure there's this one octave fuzz. I don't remember who makes it. Uh, the Dyna, Dyna Fuzz or the Octavius? Oh, the Octavius, I think. The T-Rex Octavius. Uh, Bill, the bassist, had one. And it's my favorite guitar pedal. It's the only, like, octave pedal I'll record. Um, so in that song, it's an octave pedal. Not doing the riff, it's doing the roots. Um, so I can blend it and give it a bit of, like, a chord vibe. But uh, in a lot of songs on the record, we had a bass six that came later in the game that we just went back to a bunch of songs and add it in wherever I wanted. So it was a mix of the two. It was either, yeah, it was either octave pedal or it was, uh, or it was bass six. And some, in some situations like the song stop, I was saying, 
uh it's both i just wanted a, a sludge fest in the bridge of that song nice yeah i love that and uh i remember that pedal we definitely use that uh, a bunch as well uh, oh it's so good yeah all right uh uh who's this here august augustine's asking what's your approach for guitar and bass editing and do you ever use reverb on rhythm guitars um guitar and bass editing so i'll do them on the fly while i'm tracking um because I'm doing drums last these days, I don't do drum editing on the fly because I can just like dump it to an editor. But a lot of the times I'm trying to get um, the bass tracked. I'll start with bass. I'm trying to get the bass tracked in a very specific way. Um, and that comes from like the hard compression I do on bass and things like I want to see those transients. I want to really hear the like attack of that. So I'll edit the bass as I go, because if I don't hear it finished right away, I get like really freaked out about it. and I can't focus. Um, so yeah, during tracking, I'll edit bass as I go guitars. I'll try to track, especially if it's just like strummy rhythm guitars, I'll try to track in big chunks at a time, um, solely just to keep a bit of realness. Like those can be a little sloshier than a bass guitar. They don't need to be as locked in. Although for the most part, I'll try to lock them in, especially if they're pushing, if they're pushing, I'll usually grab the whole chunk and shift it over. Um, and then when it comes to really riffy stuff, just like any, you know, riffy recording, I'll, I'll do part by part in little bits at a time and clean them up as I go along. Yeah. Cool question from Jeremiah here saying, how's your experience going to another studio and producing the band? Do you take any of your own equipment? Do you ever feel imposter syndrome? <laughs> I feel imposter syndrome every day. <laughs> um, I, uh, Union was awesome. <laughs> uh, a little background about Union. It's three... Yeah, just figure it. It's three dudes who um, are younger guys who basically set up a commercial studio, but designed it around uh, like a hybrid studio work vibe. So walking in there was very turnkey. I hated their computer, so I brought my laptop. Funny enough, I did the whole record on my laptop, and it was way more powerful than their studio computer. Um, they were really accommodating. They, they don't have NS10s there, so they let me set up NS10s. Um, they let me use my computer, especially because we had it locked out the whole time. So really what, what it was was plugging their interface, which I think they were on um, uh, an Antelope Orion, which is just USB in, plugging their interface into my laptop, and then the console and all their gear, and the way their patch base setup is super simple to follow, their console and all their gear just basically became exactly set up like my studio. So after maybe the third day in, if I needed something and the engineer wasn't around, uh, although he was pretty available all the time. Like I was, I knew what to patch in pretty easily. I can make decisions. Um, so the learning curve was really minimal, but I think that's exclusive to union. Like if I went to another bigger studio in the city, I probably would have had a, a much harder learning curve, but because they set it up like a bunch of young dudes running a hybrid studio, it was super turnkey for me to get in there and roll. Yeah. It's, it's a great place. And that it makes it so much easier like that. The more you can make it like your home studio, uh, I do the same yeah. thing. Like I'll bring whatever I need to. And if it's, you know, if it's a big SSL console or something and I'm like not familiar with the patch and the routing, I'm just like, okay, I'm doing everything in the box. Just give me two faders here on the, on yeah, the console. Exactly. Like, you know, don't, don't overcomplicate it. Right. Yeah. Aside from drums, I had the first, no, not the first two. Cause I think I would kept drums always set up, but I had maybe like channel 15, 16 were my go-to on that board of just anything I needed guitars, some to 16. And that was already set up and vocal track was, you know, 15 at any time we were ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, okay. Matt's wondering about the drum mics and how the drums were mic'd. What can you remember? Uh, I'll, I'll try to go through it. Pretty typical stuff for me so i had cam 84s the vintage neumann ones not the 184s those are overheads hats and ride um the mono overhead was a coles the the ribbon mic uh kick was beta 52 in and um oh, i don't remember what i had out probably that 47 because the option was there uh snare was sm57 top and bottom an angled one, which was really cool. It it basically completely deleted bleed from the hi hat. It was like the coolest experience. Um, and then toms were four twenty ones, good old classic four twenty ones. Mono room was a four fourteen, a vintage one. No, mono room was a yeah yeah it was four fourteen. And uh, stereo rooms were U eighty sevens way in the back at the corner. I didn't play around too much trying to get like kooky room mics i wanted just something i could that just sounded like a drum kit because that was part of that like rock vibe in the sound uh and then the talk back was 
who even knows it was probably just 57 or something like that that i just crunched yeah and all that went into all that went into the neve console i don't think i used any other pre's uh most of the eq was done on there and then i did very light compression because i've been to union a few times and i was so you know giddy being in that studio that i went nuts and i realized no i'd rather make those decisions later so not too much compression out for afterwards not too much re, uh, eq afterwards oh somebody asked earlier i totally bailed on it uh putting reverb on rhythm guitar i will if i'm trying to fill a space on one guitar on its own but i won't do it for guitars in general but yeah that, that was drums just just typical stuff that i'll normally do for drums yeah awesome all right, Leviathan is asking, sometimes I use a lot of the same settings and drum samples across multiple projects because they just sound right. I feel like I'm cheating when it works. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I feel like I'm cheating when it works too. <laughs> uh, it's Honestly, it's fine. If you're working in a specific style, something I started doing lately too, um, I'll build little presets. Like I've got a snare drum I really love recording or a couple I really love recording. I'll record those for every project because I'm really comfortable with them and I'm doing usually modern sounding records where the drums can sort of be consistent. Uh, one thing I started doing was I started making different blends of samples in Trigger um, for different styles. So, and then I'll save those as presets. So on on my main snare sound, which is you know the one that's on this record, it's like I've got a high pitch snare in there, I've got a good body snare um, and maybe a set of maybe a room if I want, but, uh, these days I'm doing rooms separately. Like I'm triggering those with MIDI, but yeah, so I'll go through, I've got like a snare sample. That I made a, one. I really like the sound of, um, a commercial high pitched one I like, and then something for body. And that's my like go-to snare. Then if I've got like a slower jam where I want this big honky snare, I'll have the main snare I made mixed with, uh, a different pack that has like a lower body, uh, snare and then some sort of like mid focus snare. So I'll, I'll make these little presets. So the core treating them is really easy. Like I, I, I fall into habit with treating them, but, uh, I can change them quickly on the fly and make a, a decision without totally screwing up templates when I'm flying ideas in and things like that. Yeah. I think, uh, I definitely agree with, with that. Um, yeah, I think it's better to only have like a kind of a handful of go-to samples that kind of work for yeah. different genres, just like you said, uh, just speeds up your workflow and you kind of craft your own sound as you, as you go along. I think that's how most big kind of bigger mixers do it. They're not auditioning like different, different kick and snare samples every, every time. Yeah. They oh yeah. I've got like folders and folders of them and I maybe use the same five. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Same here. All right. Uh, Okay, we got a question here. Are there times when you'd prefer amp sims over live amps for guitars or vice versa? 100% of the time, I'll take amp sims over live guitars. Uh, it, maybe five years ago, the line was a little more blurred, but I just don't hear the difference like I used to. Um, I'll spend a lot of time micing an amp, fiddling around, and then it's not reacting or I want a different sound. And I want to just get creative and start rolling with it. Uh, and, you know, I'm limited to the fact that I can't do that. So going with amp sims, I, same with the drum sample thing. I'll have three or four presets saved that I'm really, that I know I can jump in and get rock tones right away. And then, hey, we want something crunchy and spooky happening for a sec. I'll, I'll then, then I'll spend my time crafting something and, you know, spend 10 minutes, 20 minutes working on that instead of having to worry about uh, anything else. A big thing in my workflow is speed. Like I, I have Evertune guitars that I'll try to use when possible. I will have amp sims ready to go. I'll have like a fake drum preset ready while we're demoing. So stuff sounds exciting. And then it's just a matter of uh, swapping out quick things for creativity versus swapping out quick things to solve engineering issues. Yeah, I hope everyone's picking up a pattern here of the last couple of questions and answers. And I think this is a theme you'll see across if you got if you get to talk to or watch any kind of high level engineer producer mixer work it is very much about speed because it, it's very much about making the gear almost like invisible right it's like i mean you're, you're choosing it because it gives you certain sound is there's things you like but at the same time it's yeah. like you're never going to use something that's going to like make you work slower <laughs> or make you yeah. confused and I, i'm really seeing that come out uh with the last couple of questions and i wholeheartedly agree that's what i've witnessed too from other guys as well 
Yeah, the gear thing is, it's funny. The gear thing is like exciting when you're young and when you're trying to get a cool sound out of something. But when you start realizing, like in my path, and I'm sure you realize it too, I started shifting to the producer angle of things. The more important thing was the song. Like nobody cares about the gear at the end of the day. I care about it. You care about it. These guys definitely care about it. But the listener has no idea what an SM7 is, you know, or the listener has no idea how I mic a guitar amp off axis. They don't, they don't know what that is. So if I'm solving those things, even, even half the musicians don't really care. Like I'd say there's some guys who are really pure about guitar tones, but a lot of guys are just like, you know, they've been making demos in their bedroom for years with garage band amp sims. So even the amp sims I have are a step up from that. So they're not too particular or picky about those. They just want to get like rocking right away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's a cool question from Joe. If you had recorded this album in your own studio, and for those of you guys who don't know, uh, same studio I mentioned it before is like is fairly small, especially compared to where this was recorded. Uh, so if you recorded it there, would you have made different decisions, and would you still be able to produce the same mix you achieved? Um, I would have definitely made different decisions. Drums probably would have all been left to the end, and we would have <clears throat> just focused on pre-pro in that first week. Uh, however guitars would have been untouched vocals would have been untouched um and honestly like i love how the drums came out on that record i think union helped but i think it might have only been like a 10 percent help which sometimes is a really big deal but at the end of the day you know like i was saying union set up like my studio basically just it looks incredible um I, I would have had everything just ready to go at all times in my place. We would have been plugging in, working with amp sims anyways. So I don't think the I don't think the end result would have been much different to be honest. I think it would have uh, it would have been the same. But the upside, especially for a band like Silverstein, doing their tenth record, you, you know, they fall into their own uh, ways and things like that. Being at Union was more an experience at the end of the day than anything else. Like it's like going on going on like a vacation or something. And, and that's how we wanted to treat it. So, you know, not every, you know, the control room at union is basically the size of my whole studio. And so some people could just chill in the back and not worry. Some guys, there's a lounge they can, I've got a lounge, but it's, you know, it's garbage, but like they can go up to a kitchen and make some lunch and, and brew some coffee and they love coffee and I love coffee. So, you know, it's awesome for that. Whereas, you know, at my studio to, to leave, you step out the door and there's some stuff to do down the street and whatever, but you're leaving the building, you're going out, you're, you know, five minutes by the time you're out of the door, five minutes by the time you're back in, whereas at Union, you can just step out for a few seconds, grab a breath of fresh air, pop back in. So that that is the thing I wonder too when I think about it. I wonder if we made the record at my studio, would the vibe that influenced the decisions be the same? And I don't think that it would have been. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. R really interesting. Less about the gear and the room really, but just more the the, how the room feels, uh, as experience yeah, totally. There. Yeah. And I'm learning that a bit these days. Like I want to, I want a bigger control room. I've wanted one for a long time. I don't want to give up a drum room cause I love recording my own drums. But as I get a little bit older, I realize maybe I should move to oh, my cat's showing up. Maybe I should move to getting a, a big control room just for the comfort factor, you know, like just so everybody's vibing on, on the room at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's pretty important. Uh, okay, Diego's asking, how much time does it take for you to mix a song? I'm struggling with speeding up my process. <laughs> it uh, It's funny. If you're mixing a lot of songs, and I'm sure you, you found this too, it's it's sort of this little exponential thing. So I'll spend, oh my God, I will spend anywhere from anywhere from two to six hours on the first mix, get really angry, go home, listen in the morning and realize I had nothing to be angry about, send that mix off, make sure everybody's digging it. And then I'll spend anywhere from 30 to 30 minutes to an hour on every other song after that. But it's that like six hour process slash sleeping on it. That is the, you know, the bones of the mixes to begin with. So, so yeah, it's, it's tough to say you're going to struggle on the first mix, but if it's, a, especially if it's an album where you've kept tones consistent, you'll be pretty safe throughout the rest of it afterwards. Yeah. Nice. All right, guys, we'll probably wrap up fairly soon. So get any last questions in while you can. Uh, okay, Ben's asking, how do you decide how many layers of vocals you use in large sections like courses? 
as in choosing between six background layers or just using left, right, center takes or simple doubling? How do you make those, those decisions? Uh, I'll generally make them uh, on a per song basis. Uh, I'll do them on like a per album in terms of tone, uh, like uh, in terms of like stylistic approach, especially with a chorus. Like a lot of times I'll just double choruses, but if it's an album where I want a slicker vocal, I will triple a chorus because it, it locks in and acts more of like a chorusy effect versus me wanting a double. Um, but then on a per song basis where I sort of talked about like in Bad Habits, I doubled the verse vocals, which I don't ever do because I wanted them to feel a little more exciting and a little more like punching you in the face. So I'll, I'll make decisions that happen on a per song basis, but I'll decide on the core parts of the ideas pretty early on. And then when it comes to backing vocals and harmonies, I'll go crazy with them and then just trim back. Like I'd rather track a ton of stuff and then realize, Hey, this verse doesn't need anything and delete it all. But at least I tried every option and then, uh, and and then you know just trim down to almost nothing cool all right simple one here what amp sims are you using what are your favorites uh stl tonality was one i used a lot lately although they just released um one called tone hub and it's all of their kemper packs which i think are really high quality kemper packs built into a plugin so i actually ended up selling my kemper and just sticking to that one because i used so many of their tones to begin with when i had my kemper um, and they're one to one, like I've shot it out a few times. So STL tone hub and in STL tone hub, I'll use the Lee Malia pack. The guy from bring me the horizon, his 800 sound exactly how I want 800s to sound. Um, the Feldman pack for a couple leads and a couple crunchy guitars. And then I'll just sort of sh- cycle through. And if I want something different, um, those are usually those are like when I want something tasty, I'll go, I'll just, I'll do anything like. I had Waves guitar in that song just because I think it came from pre-pro when Paul Mark was tracking and that's all he had and I wanted to mangle it anyway so it didn't really matter what the guitar tone was. Yeah, nice. All right, Nick's asking, how do you feel about using only MIDI drums for a project? What would be the main thing you'd focus on to get it sounding realistic? Uh, I, I have no problem using MIDI drums. I used to hate it. I still kind of do, but I've learned how to make it work. So one big thing I'll focus on is the dynamics of the cymbals. I don't particularly care about the dynamics of the drums because I'll replace I'll replace any MIDI drum program with samples from my library that I like the sound of. But the cymbals, especially hi-hats, oh my god, they you need to like spend the time on those. So if I'm doing a product a project where it's all MIDI, I'll maybe do my best to excuse me, to like really spend time on the dynamic of the ah, on the dynamic of those of those elements like uh like hi hats and things like that. Yeah, awesome. Uh, okay, here's an interesting one, and we'll take a few more, guys. Um, random question: Do you own or rent your studio space? Uh, any advice for someone who's kind of looking to move out of a home studio to a to a dedicated space? Uh, I rent my space. Uh, I I got it. I got into the city at a pretty good time, and I'm in one of the much more affordable buildings in the city. Or else, I would probably be making moves to own a place because uh as you know building a studio can cost like a lot of money um so owning versus renting you don't you don't maybe want to drop like a ton of cash into a place you don't own um so i'd recommend owning if you can if you're if you're in an area where it's affordable to get a mortgage on a commercial place especially if you're doing like a business thing at the beginning you can usually get money for those sort of things uh if not uh i I don't think renting is the worst idea, especially if you're just building a really good control room too, because you're only putting the cash into that at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's take this as the last question. And well, the last question here from the audience, and then I've got a few rapid fire questions I want to throw at you and then we'll wrap it up. So Lauren's asking, did you use reference tracks when making this album? And what do you listen for when comparing reference tracks to your tracks? Uh, I don't think I used reference tracks on this. I think um, I think I just kind of wanted to dial in a sound and roll with it and and treat it as a new thing. I'll use reference tracks later in a mix though, just to see that stuff's on par in terms of elements. So like making sure my low end is is okay, making sure the brightness is nice. Um, but I'm not I'm not using a reference track to match like a vibe. So I'm not like pulling up a song and listening to the snare drum and trying to sort of match that. I'm just using references to make sure I'm actually, uh, you know, 
in the ballpark with low end and things like that. Do you have any favorite reference tracks that you always use? Um, a lot of that new Bring Me the Horizon record has a boatload of low end that just like sneaks in. So I'm checking that. And it's also not super stylistically hyped or anything, even though the songs are crazy produced. Uh, so I'll use that to make sure I'm keeping an organic vibe, especially if I'm working on a large thing. Um, I'll use, um, uh, I don't remember which song, but something off actually I'm alive often because I always loved the balance of that record that you did. Like I, I loved how the drums always sounded. So I'll use that if I'm trying to find a, an organic drum sound and I'm not nailing it, say if I'm mixing another person's track or something. Um, and then I'll go back every once in a while and listen to Paramore's Riot because even though that snare and kick are just disgustingly massive, that record just sits so well constantly. And the better, it's funny, you could tell some songs are mixed better on that, like the singles, like Misery Business just sounds perfect. So that song pretty much since 2007 or whenever it came out has been in my like reel. Yeah, that's on that's on my reference list as well. Probably in a lot of yeah. a lot of people. <laughs> oh yeah, it's yeah. huge. Yeah. All right, this this has been awesome, dude. I'm gonna throw f- a few ra- rapid fire questions at you, and then uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So, cool. rapid fire question one: three. What are three plugins that you could not live without? A router, um, CLA seventy six, and Fab Filter EQ three or Pro Q three. Nice. Follow-up question. What have you found any difference or have you tried many of the other distressor models like the slate one or. Yeah. So the slate one and arouser in my mind can be identical, which is awesome. So if you own the slate subscription, let's say like you're set with a great distressor, the arouser can then go further. You can clip a little more on it. You can uh, shape it's um, side chaining a little bit better and different things like that. So you can use it like as a de or things like that. Um, but those two and i'm pretty sure the uad i have this theory that they're all they all share some sort of secret code and are all identical (laughs) uh uh yeah so like say you've got the slate one you've got basically a real distressor right there you don't need to go get a rouser but if you want a little bit more control a rouser is like the one to go with nice all right one mic you couldn't live without oh probably the u87 even though the SM7 is awesome, I don't find I can do everything with it. Whereas a U87, I find I can do everything with it. Interesting. Okay. What's one mic on the flip side that you would be happy to never use again? <laughs> um, every, every single kick mic. I don't know why. I hate how they sound. None of them have sounded how I want a kick mic to sound yet. And you're constantly doing so much work to them. So just get rid of kick mics. I'll just program them. All, there's a bunch of great sounding kick drums. <laughs> That's so true, eh? Like every like, there's so many kick mics out there, but no matter what, like we're all doing just a crazy amount of EQ on every kick drum, no matter yeah. what. <laughs> every kick mic, I, they just sound like, and then you're just spending an hour on it. Yeah, yeah, so true. All right, um, what's your favorite snare drum? You're a drummer. You mentioned you have a few snare drums that you like to use. What are one or two of your favorites? Uh, Black Beauty is my favorite snare drum, the six and a half. It's so good. Although I fell in love with uh, Paul Kohler's Bell Brass snare yes. while we were recording, it oh my god, I can't believe that snare exists. So the drum tech we hired for the record uh, owned one, the exact same one, like a U drum Bell Brass, and he's like, I never use it; it never really gets rented out. If you want to buy it, go for it. I bought it, and I haven't used anything but that Bell Brass since. Yeah, that is a great, great sounding snare drum. Oh. Um, yeah, I think we use that on all the records that we did together as well okay yeah. last last question um you can you can alter this if you want i was gonna ask the best singer you've ever worked with uh that'd be cool for someone to check that out or if you can't think of one you could maybe best musician um best singer i've ever worked with oh man that is a tough one I'm trying to think uh just like going through records in my head um i don't know Kyle Anderson from the after image is an incredible singer. He took every bit of advice I threw at him and he was able to basically deliver anything I wanted. Also, he's an unreal screamer and can do every scream on the face of the earth perfectly. Um, and I'll, I'll answer both actually. And, um, the best musician I've ever worked with was Aaron from intervals. I 
don't think there's a better guitar player on the planet. <laughs> yeah. Guy's nuts. Yeah, super, super solid. Pleasure. He's a pleasure to work with for sure. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. All right, Sam. Well, this was killer. I think everyone here got tons of value out of it. And uh, yeah, thank you to all you guys who showed up and hung out for this entire stream. You guys are awesome too. Thanks for all those questions and inter interaction. Uh, if you missed some of this, replay will be up on the YouTube channel soon, a couple of minutes, I think, as soon as it processes. But anyways, guys, thank you for hanging out. Thank you again, Sam. Really appreciate you spending the time with us here oh, today. Thank you so much for having me, man. It means a lot. Yeah, no, no problem. And you guys definitely pay attention to what Sam's doing. He's got some cool projects coming down uh, the pipe. And uh, those of you guys who are into uh, our hardcore music, hardcore music studio community, uh, you know, he's a member in the group there. So keep in touch and uh, follow Sam, follow his stuff, find his YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, thanks again, man. And we'll uh, see all you guys again soon. All right. See ya.